My name is Peter Bergen. I'm uh, director of the International Security Program here at New America. It's my uh, great uh, pleasure to introduce Jack Fairweather, uh, who, as you know, has just written this excellent new book, The Good War, Why We Couldn't Win the War and Peace in Afghanistan, Why We Couldn't Win the War or the Peace in Afghanistan. Jack is presently a uh, correspondent for Bloomberg based in Istanbul. His wife, uh, Christina, is here today as well. He's also a journalist and writer. Um, and previously wrote a book, A War of Choice, uh, about Iraq, which also got very good reviews. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you, Jack. Thank you. Um, th thanks, Peter. Just checking everyone can, everyone can hear me. Um, thanks very much for, for having me. Um, I started writing this book um, long ago, in some ways, in 2007, when I traveled to Afghanistan for the Washington Post for the first time and, and ended up living there for, for a year. Um, it's quite a sort of crucial period as it turned out as it was um, before the surge and you can really break down Afghan history into or recent Afghan history into uh, the, the pre-surge days and, and those that followed that take us up to the present and the, the current ending of combat operations next month. Um, and it was, you know, it was clear to me then that the, the nature of the US occupation and nation building program was going was going awry, and so the book sort of started as a as a way to sort of ask the question: How do we get to how do we get to this state of affairs? We all remember back in two thousand and one that the the primary aim of invading Afghanistan was to uh, was to deal with Al Qaeda, and to a large extent that strategic objective was was achieved in the first few months. Bin Laden wasn't killed, but the organization, as Peter has written about, was largely sent underground and lots of hard work that followed, but it was sufficiently contained um, that there wasn't, hasn't been a, a major attack on uh, US soil since. The, um, the big mistake that we made, um, and really I mean President Bush hi here, is in conflating Al-Qaeda with the Taliban. And um, that in that famous speech, you're either with us or against us. And that was to do a, a make a critical uh, conceptual error to link the threat of global jihad represented by Al Qaeda with the sort of tribal Islam that the Taliban represented. And so we got rid of Al Qaeda from Afghanistan. We were presented with the challenge of tackling tribal Islam. That's not a war that can be won in Frank, uh, to be <laughs> in, in short. It's, uh, it's a generational conflict that's better waged, not with guns, but through education and, and, and soft power. And we, the US, created this, this fundamental mistake that I, that I think we should be thinking of in terms of the errors in Iraq where, w where the US disbanded the Iraqi military and tried to, uh, and the process of debathification. Those are held up now as these sort of key moments in the reason why that war went so badly wrong. I think it's not necessarily understood that our failure, that our failure to uh, engage with the Taliban after 9-11 was a similar moment. We also went on to persecute the Taliban at great length and um, it has become sort of very fashionable to blame Pakistan for the, the rebirth of the Taliban and um, I think we often don't look at the way in which our own actions, the US Special Forces, the military contributed to re-energizing the Taliban, a movement that was discredited in in Afghanistan in, in the early years, and one which was actually actively suing for peace, as I write about in the book, um, a completely key moment um, in, in December when the newly appointed President Karzai met a delegation from the Taliban who brought with them a letter of surrender from Mullah Omar. They sat, had tea, and as I was able to piece together from talking to some of those who attended, um, they went as far as talking about <coughs> you know, wh the number of cars that ex-Taliban ministers would receive uh, and the sort of security arrangements they would have in, in Kabul. That's, uh, that deal went up to Rumsfeld and he said, he said no, the, this sort of prism of with us or against us 
that um, was, you know, confused U.S. thinking at the time. And you know, frankly, we've been struggling to get back to that moment ever since over the last 13 years. We've been fighting the wrong war uh, for the past 13 years, and that's the war not again not to contain Al Qaeda, but against against tribal Islam. And been a number of turning points that have brought us deeper into that war. I write about the, the moment when Donald Rumsfeld went from being a sort of hands-off, uh, you know, hands-off military guy to an to a interventionist. There was a very key intellectual transformation that took place over the course of 2003. Uh, there were other moments like the British who, um, cr you know, provided the fulcrum around which the war went uh, you know, rapidly deteriorated with their invasion of Helmand in 2006. And that's a, an episode that's also not necessarily well known um, and one that uh, you know, a lot of people always ask, why did, why did we end up doing all that fighting in Helmand? <coughs> and you can trace that back to uh, the, the British attempt to try and, uh, d d try and do a, a bit of nation building light on, at the behest of the Americans. Um, there is a good war that we have been fighting for the 13 years, and it hasn't been with troops, and it hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been with drones. It's been these largely isolated, unreported um, accommodations that at different times and different places, different militaries have been striking with, with tribal leaders across um, the south and eastern Afghanistan. These are small local deals that have bought peace and have shown a promise for the future. I'm not, you know, I'm, the last 13 years have been, a, have been you know, many missteps and we've gone in the wrong direction, but there is, there is this sort of pattern, there, is a, th there are glints of light at the end of the tunnel. It's a very long tunnel uh, and the, the light is very distant, but um, the, these deals that, um, that I write about in the book offer real promise. When aligned with some of the really great work that Afghans themselves have been doing at building up civil society. And again, we completely neglected um, a lot of local nation building efforts uh, in the early years of the war. Um, I write quite a lot about Ashraf Ghani, who I think um, the, the current president, who in the early years was the finance minister. He created a program entirely funded um, by Afghans, administered by Afghans, which allowed local communities to select projects that they wanted to build, gave them the money to build it, and hand it over to them to implement. It was probably one of the least corrupt programs there has been in Afghanistan, partly because the mu sums of money were so small, um, and it was also one of the most effective. Um, there were more, uh, the program was called the National Solidarity Program. There were more schools built through that program than through the vastly more costly um, US effort, um, whereby, where a, a school through the NSP program cost $20,000. Uh, the US government's uh, contracted schools cost $200,000. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, in some ways that's the story of the, the, the nation building effort. It's perhaps not a real surprise that we w struggled to get to grips with Afghanistan as we saw it entirely through our own lens. It became a, a reflecting hall of mirrors, um, mostly concerned with public opinion back home, securing more funding and, um, and continu continuing, the, you know, continuing the bubble for as long as possible. Um, that bubble is now deflating, the troops are coming home, and I think one of the things I've been telling people is that you know, this is an opportunity now for the programs that we've neglected, the accommodations that we haven't built upon, it's an opportunity for us to take those and you know, with Afghan leadership, build, build on them. And um, I think one of my big concerns is that we're not seeing, um, we're not seeing a level of interest from the Obama in administration in doing that. Um, and you know, there's a tendency, as there was with Iraq once the combat mission ended, to sort of head for the exits and, and try and forget about it. And I think that would be a, a, a tragic mistake, as great as many of those that have 
taken place in the last 13 years. Um, Afghans, if you ask them, and that's something that rarely happens, if you ask them, want US engagement. They want help in some of these nation building programs, in some of these accommodations, but on their own terms. And um, you know, I, my, my hope is that we listen to them, and my fear is that we will continue to ignore them just as we have done when we were surging. Um, so, we, so we are not listening to them as we withdraw. So, uh, so with the <laughs> that, that sort of bittersweet uh, ending, I will uh, hand it over uh, to, uh, to any questions, as I'm sure there are s some here who have got intimate knowledge of Afghanistan, and I'd love to um, hear your questions. And, and also well, Jack, so one of the things that I always find puzzling, <coughs> and you spent a lot of time in Iraq, and Christina did as well, um, is Americans, I think, tend to bracket Iraq and Afghanistan in the same, like, very bad place. And yet, um, there are big differences between the two countries. I mean, today, you're 12, more, 12, 12, 12 times more likely to be killed in Iraq as a civilian in the war going on now, the renewed civil war, as you are to be killed in Afghanistan. So why, why is there, there this disconnect? And we're all in the, you and I, in the journalism business, and, you know, have journalism, have journalists sort of failed to adequately explain the differences or or what? I mean, why, why is it, and am I wrong about that assumption that Americans tend to bracket them together? I, I, I mean, I think the fact that it is more peaceful in Afghanistan now is testimony to the surge. I mean, I disagreed with it at the time as an idea, but it has bought hmm. peace. Uh, it, uh, and, uh, you know, and that's, uh, you know, that's not, uh, that's a testimony to unbelievable amount of hard work that I saw in reporting the book in, um, in Helmand and other places, um, that piece is just is simply not one that's being built upon. Um, it, it's entirely unreported. But the last two years, the U.S. military has been withdrawing from these small communities where they've, you know, fought, um, and that should have been the opportunity for the you know to help the afghans connect with the local with the tribal folk and we haven't we've handed over as quickly as we could to the afghan government and you know we're seeing now that they're not able to strike those deals and the mm. taliban are the taliban are returning the whole surge in effect has become as it was in iraq a, a face saving exercise so I, I mean i agree that right now it's it is it is safer as mm. it were, I mean, you know. Well, it's always been safer. I mean, it's just it, the Afghan, you know, well, you were in Iraq in what right. were the years where you were there? 03 to 06. Yeah. So, like, you know, to go out to a restaurant in Baghdad in 07 would be to sign your own death warrant. Right. As an, uh, you know, that, that is not an experience that has ever really happened in Afghanistan. It may be a little bit, there have been random attacks on Westerners right. of late. But it just, you know, Afghanistan is sort of doing okay, relatively speaking, right? right? I mean, that, and right. that's... Right, and I'm sorry, I, I, my answer was somewhat skewed towards the, you know, Helmand and the... Right. And, and actually, the, uh, you know, we're very focused on the, uh, you know, the so we're very focused on these areas where, in actual fact, not much of the population lives, contrary to well, the great coin uh, doctrine. Right, so this was, this was very puzzling. So, you know, 1% of the population of Afghanistan lives in, Af lives in Helmand, right? right? And yet... You know, there was this vast American presence there and British presence, and we put in this, and it, and it, it would seem to defy the basic tenets of population-centric strategy. So in the people that you talked to, what was their defense of this, if any? They, I mean, I spoke to a guy called Mick Nicholson, who, mm. you know, was the man who really envisioned where the surge should go. He was a, you know, a, a very fine officer who served in, in the Eastern Campaign and you know, 06, 07, and, and actually uh, um, sort of introduced before Petraeus did the idea of counterinsurgency, very much based on his, you know, on the, on the right idea that mechanized military operations mm. don't work in Afghanistan and there needs to be a more sensitive approach. Um, he wanted to center the surge in Kandahar. Mm. Um, this is something that, you know, this is an aspect of the story that hasn't really been um, told before this this debate in 2008 um, about where the surge sh should go, um, and the Brits persuaded him that it should be in Helmand mm. um, because they were there. Because they were there, the and um, and in desperate desperate trouble. 
Mm. Um, and is this a bit like trying to defeat Nazi Germany by attacking Austria? I mean, is that what it turned out to be? Or what, I mean, what, how effective was this? And is there, is there any reasonable defense of putting all this effort into Helmand rather than Kandahar, which is the center of Taliban, the center of our gravity, right? I, 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 don't, I think fundamentally, no. Because yeah. I think you know, the question you always have to ask yourself in Afghanistan and is, you know, you know, what is the trajectory that the country is on minus our presence there? Or mm. rather, you know, what is the sustainable sort of enduring vision for what the Afghan government can do in the country? And we never asked that question. We always confused our ambitions for the country with, <laughs> with the reality. And I think if you look at and speak to Afghans and say, you know, what's it going to be like in Helmand in, in 10 years? They don't have, they're not talking about sort of, you know, district councils that have got line ministry members from, from the central government. They're, you know, they're talking about, a, you know, very stripped down administration, maybe one or two officials. Um, and that's because it's one of the poorest places in the world, right? I mean, it has no resources other than opium. Th yes, although uh, so <laughs> that's, well, that's a, a, big big a, big, a, big, a big resource, <laughs> and that's actually a very, a very interesting um, sort of. Hopefully, we'll uh, will co come on to. But I mean, the Afghan model for you know for several hundred years has been a very hands-off, decentralized mm. approach. We tried to take the opposite approach, and you can by imposing an incredibly centralized system, actually more cent uh, uh, the, the envisioning of the centralized system we were creating is far more so than we actually have in the states. I mean, it's well, we like if we like if President Obama could appoint every governor and also every you know, every county commissioner almost, right? right? I mean, right. I mean, this is sort of like it's the most we and why did that happen? I mean, was that just because people weren't thinking when they they went to Bonn and they didn't have a lot of time? They just sort of they didn't think it through. No, I think it was a, it was a function of the militarization of the war. I mean, the U.S opted for th something called uh, provincial reconstruction teams um, as a way, as a sort of softly, softly approach to getting, uh, you know, to get getting into nation building. The US military is very centralized, right? Mm. You can, you, you can, you can pick up a phone and, sp and issue an order. The, you know, I mean, in terms of the history, I mean, the, the wasn't the constitutional, the way the constitution was set up was set up at Bonn in a relatively short period. There, weren't, there wasn't a US military involvement in that, was there? That, that's true, um, but I think the Bonn Agreement was loose enough. I see. That I mean, it was there to be, it was there to be interpreted, um, and you know, Karzai did a huge amount of what I think was actually quite good work, which we didn't appreciate or really understand mm. in terms of appointing figures across the South that were going to buttress his rule. We mentioned of Karzai, you know, in 2002, he was the world's greatest statesman, and by 2011, right. he was the world's worst human being, right. at least by Washington was concerned. So <laughs> neither of those things can be simultaneously true. So what is, I mean, he's obviously a complicated guy, and he had a very complicated job. And what, to what extent in the book, I mean, did he change over time, or was he always this kind of, I mean, what are you, what's your assessment? Um, well, I actually try and, one of the aims of the book was to try and, bring a bit more sort of balance to how we see Karzai. Yeah. Um, we never got Karzai when did he- Did anybody, I mean, did McChrystal get him more right than others? Um, um, he seemed to have a better relationship he, with he, certain people. He did, but, uh, but again, he didn't actually l really listen to what Karzai was telling mm. him, which was that he wasn't that into the surge. Oh, yeah. So um, well that's there a pretty a key there issue. There is a gr yes, there is a famous McChrystal story where he uh, called up Karzai to ask him permission for a certain military right. operation, which no previous general had ever done. That's true. Although, as I write in the book, um, when he had that, uh, when he went to ask Karzai permission, it actually turned out that the the general down south had already launched the operation. <laughs> Because Karzai w had a cold and was in bed and couldn't okay. be reached in time. I mean, actually, McCry it wasn't Mc it wasn't like McChrystal. Well, anyway, it, yeah. the operation was already already underway. Thankfully, Karzai said yes. But then, you know, that's the position we've put Karzai in. Whether we ask him <laughs> to yeah. or not, we, we do what we w want to do. Um, you know, I think we, you know, early on we we did not we undermined him. I mean, if he had 
he, he wanted to sign a peace deal or uh, accept the surrender of the Taliban. Yeah. He had a very different vision of the Taliban than we did. I mean, he consistently said the Taliban, back then, the Taliban are our brothers, they're, you know, they're from the villages, they're, you know, they're uh, commanders who fought against the Soviets and became, you know, who were once on our side. These guys are, you know, we, we can work with them. And yeah. we, we didn't do that. I mean, his, his, his rule in the South was undermined from the start because you had soft operatives going around under the guidance of various warlords who were settling their own personal vendettas. Yeah. As Anand Gopal writes, so well, I was going to mention, you know, yeah. Anand is a fellow here, and of course, just had a, a very well-reviewed book. And I right. think, you know, Anand did a lot of, I think, the pioneering exactly. work on the issue of right. the opportunity that was lost in Kandahar, which right. is people really did want to do a peace deal. I know that right. you spoke to Robert Bob Grenier, right, for right. the reporting. Right. And Bob Grenier, for those who don't know, was a CIA station chief in Pakistan, and actually met with the number two leader of the Taliban twice to actually talk about a deal uh, around handing over bin Laden and. Uh, this guy was there definitely with Mullah Omar's say so, and there seemed to be some glimmer of a potential deal. So I mean, there was a whole, s in that early period, there was a t time when a deal might have, you know, of some kind could have right. been organized. Right, uh, in actual fact, the, it wasn't before we went in that was the key negotiating time. We thought it was, it was yeah. actually in the, right. in the aftermath, and we just, we, f we forgot about them. The, I mean, the bond, uh, I mean, it's odd that we sort of hold up debathification and getting rid of the yeah. Iraqi military as, you know, even you know, as even the sort of general public have a sort of vague idea yeah. about those key strategic mistakes. I, that that's a very good point. I mean, I think that to the extent that when you're going out talking about the book, that's to, to explain that because I think most people don't know that piece of history. Right, and the the, the Bonn Agreement was as uh, you know as a document riven through with the same ideological mistakes as. Uh, and there were no representatives of the Taliban there, obviously. Right. right. Um, which raises an interesting question about the whole, because I've always thought, that, I mean, as, as the conflict went on, I thought a peace deal with the Taliban was sort of a pipe dream for a lot of reasons. Um, maybe not of that window you're talking right. about because it seemed very pr promising, but as time went on, you know, we, the Pakistani government have done multiple agreements with the Taliban, they've all failed. Um, uh, which is, you know, and they don't see a distinction of, the, they, for them, the border doesn't exist. So when we talk about the Taliban, it's on both sides of the border. So just, I mean, what was, I mean, does President Ghani have a chance now with the Taliban, for instance, or, or what's your view on? I, I think the the idea of concluding a deal with the Taliban leadership remains a pipe dream. Hmm. Um, because? That it's just not in their hmm. interest. I mean, I mean, why? I mean, from their perspective, they've just defeated another superpower and or are about to, and they can do you think they really believe that, or I mean, is that certainly that's what they would say, you know, in their own propaganda? But they haven't, they haven't really taken. Can you, I mean, they have not taken a major even town for any length of time, right? I, I think it's, it's not ISIS, which is taking over 400 it, no, miles from no, Aleppo and to and Fallujah. I think, and I think that speaks to your earlier point yeah. about how Afghanistan and Iraq are different. And, and I should, you know, the Taliban is not a monolithic entity. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's the leadership that has been doing some, some parts of which have been doing some talks. Some of them, are, you know, they have operational commanders hmm. in the South, but there's still a divide between them and a lot of these tri you know, tribal groups and some, you know, drug cartel type groups. Um, and it's, it's a, always been a very murky picture. And hmm. it's always been the case that the Taliban is, you know, as much seeking their support as, you know, right. as, as they are, uh, you know. Well, I thought a very interesting point is your point about these local ceasefires, which, have, you know, that obviously tamped down the civil war in Iraq, and you're saying that also helped uh, sort of keep Afghanistan pretty stable. So do you see those, uh, uh, you know, obviously the United States and NATO were pulling back, but the Afghan National Army hasn't been the disaster many people prognosticize, right? I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of doing, in my impression, it seems to be doing okay-ish. I mean, I spoke to um, <coughs> the deputy commander of NATO forces about six months ago, a year ago maybe, and he, um, you know, his view of where Afghanistan is going to be is a, sli is a slightly dim one. I mean, he yeah. sees most of Hellman's being in, in some shape or form back in the com control of the, of the Taliban. And that's, you know, right. that's the Taliban with small t, yeah. <laughs> as it were. But does that really matter? 
It, well, that's, yeah. I precisely. mean, that kind of goes to your point about, I mean, what the Paul Helmond expeditionary force seemed to be, the whole premise didn't make any sense. Right. Uh, so right. And, um, but. I, I mean, there, I mean that, so uh, there is a, like a, a fundamental issue, which is how to, is our attitude towards opium. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm, it, it's. Which is at record levels now. Which is at record levels now. I've, you know, I took part in anti uh, poppy eradication drives. So did I. God, that was a disaster. In Helmand. Yeah. You know, was gone. Yeah, they yeah. were not happy, the locals. Yeah, the, the most bizarre, I mean, I've, yeah. it's their, it, it is their cash crop. And in 2002, we had an opportunity, you know, because the year before the Taliban had had a, had a, a freeze, we had an opportunity to really help the Afghan government take control of the opium crop and, mm. and, and legalize it. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's not some left field crazy view. We've done it in India and we've done it in Turkey with yeah. extraordinary success yeah. um, re relative to... I, what I think that was an ideological position of the Bush administration, not to, not to when you say legalize it, allow it to be used in the, le in the, morphine, right. in the legalized right. morphine exactly. market. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, um, and, and which... Yeah, I, I, it was puzzling why that didn't happen. Well, I think in, on the U.S. it just didn't really cross their radar. The Brits actually <laughs> so were pushing mm. eradicate, uh, pushing a sort of anti-opium uh, line. And there's also the case that some of the major morphine producers, like Canada, like Australia, mm. didn't want. It's a cartel. Yeah, it's, right. a, it's, a, it's their own cartel, the right. mor legal morphine business, and they didn't want. I mean, if they had sort of taken the initiative, maybe they could have, uh, you know, incorporated them, but they didn't. In fact, the opposite, they wanted uh, to. Are there any sort of people in the book uh, on the US or NATO side that come out of this well? I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, uh, there are a number of wonderful diplomats, soldiers, Afghan officials, whose story, I mean, partly because it's so set against the trajectory of the war, which wasn't up, it was consistently down. Um, their work really stands out. And so, I mean, that's why in my remarks, I say I'm still sort of somewhat hopeful that we, that as the military nation building effort drains away, that we're going to turn back to, to these guys who were doing, doing work. There was a great um, UN diplomat, very young, young guy, straight out of grad school, who was placed um, in the, in the in the middle of one of the most complicated tribal entanglements involving Haqqani, whose network we've been variously uh, fighting against um, from the start. And he, quick, he quickly reached out to Haqqani, so no particular, it didn't get any permission to do so. Um, and you know, within a few months, he had built a sort of a settlement between the, between the tribes, they were doing small reconstruction work along the, the lines of this program I mentioned by Ghani. And, and this diplomat was, you know, he knocked on the door of Haqqani's brother's house in Kabul. The guy, this guy had been detained by the Americans for, f for a year or two, uh, tortured by them, was not very, had no desire to see any Westerners again. And yet this diplomat- Who's the diplomat? Tom Gregg, who works yeah. with Barney Rubin up in, um, with NYU and has, has been working on with some, tr trying to utilize those contacts going forwards. But I mean, just a, just a very small little window on, you know, knocking on the door, having the tea, making a deal, explaining what you're doing, um, that, you know, bought, bought peace for, f you know, for a year or two. I mean, uh, there are huge pressures on that deal that he struck and, you know, ultimately, as is the way of things, as for a young man, he doesn't, doesn't want to spend, if he was there for two and a half years in, Ga in Gardez, mm. um, that's a very long posting. Um, yeah. And, <laughs> he, and, and he left. And I noticed in Gardez they had pictures of Najib Bull, which I thought was interesting. Uh, yeah. You know, it's very, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a complicated country. But what's the uh, prognosis going forward? A Ghani, do you think, is doing a reasonable job, and, or what? I, I mean, I think the you know the end state. What we're going to see emerge is already emerging. Is you know, Afghan government will retain control of all the major 
major cities mm. and you know in the, the tribal hinterlands there will be you know a mixture of different warring groups um, do you think President Hillary Clinton or President Jeb Bush are going to um, be okay with withdrawing all these troops at the end of 2016 I suspect they will they probably they probably will because I think um, you know, contain. I mean, you know, the focus has shifted to Iraq, to Iraq, and but do the thought experiment where there's a, some kind of terrorist attack on the United States that can be traceable to the AFPAC region right. well in then, 2018. Yeah. The political costs. I mean, I think it, it. I don't think any any president in his or her right mind is going to. There's no. There's nothing. We have a strategic partnership agreement with Afghanistan until 2024. So, I think you know, it's if you can change. It's not. There's nothing's written in stone here. Right. Um, and I think, you know, as you indicated in your remarks, I think. Afghans regard the United States, they don't want a big U.S. military presence, but they do want some kind of security guarantees. Right. 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 I, I mean, I, I would be surprised if Clinton or Bush were to, <laughs> you know, send another 100,000 troops, right. um, you know, back in again. I think there will be an enduring commitment. My, my concern is that it's not going to be allied with, you know, a sort of, a sort of message of hope for the Afghan people that we're going to we're going to work with them to try and fix politically some of these some of these problems. I think you know containment as a strategy does work, and I think, mm. but it 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 doesn't help you fix the problem. It just helps you. Well, meaning what? Well, when you say fix the problem, mean meaning what what would, what would be required? Afghanistan's in the middle as, as in a thirty-year civil war. Yeah. There is a fundamental process of reconciliation that needs to take place, mm. um, and we we've never given it serious credence. I mean, we sort of slightly farmed it out to Karzai to manage. He never, he was in in a particular sort of and you know <laughs> in a do nothing phase of yeah. of his career. And um, but it, it, well, you know, one but when you say you know if you look at the coalitions around Ghani and Abdullah, they're actually much you know cross ethnic lines, and that's a form right. of reconciliation, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the Afghans going to have to do them for themselves, and right, um, right. I mean, I, I mean I'm back to your question about Ghani. I mean, I'm very hopeful. I mean, he's the only man who would is capable of taking Afghanistan from a sixteen billion dollar aid budget a year to three or four. Maybe mm. that it's that it's going to be a, you know this giant sort of drop off in in funding because precisely because he's had this sh you know he he, he can re he can rebuild Afghanistan in a in a meaningful way he's yeah. less proven in his ability to you know re work with other tribal groups in the, in the south I you know the the Tajik minority will you know will s swing swing behind him um, but it's you know I don't know whether he will be able to to do half of what Karzai did in his mm. the early years of his presidency I, I think he's you know he also uh, you know he has a you know uh, ideological view of the Taliban mm. as, as well and I think there's a uh, you know, as ever, there's you know, as because in the 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 U.S. we also have a, a view of the Taliban. It will be convenient to keep keep the the bombs falling. So, how do you see Pakistan? Sort of, uh, we had yesterday General Rayil Sharif, the head of chief of the Army Staff, come and speak uh, at a sort of off the record event. But mm -hmm. um, what's your assessment of like how Pakistan will play with the new Afghan government? I mean. There remains, as there has been from the beginning, a sort of fundamental alignment of interests if the two sides <laughs> wanted a fundamental alignment of interests. Which is like, Af if Afghanistan has another civil war, that's not good for uh, Pakistan. Right, and uh, Pakistan has also been fighting against the Taliban, yeah. uh, and you know, the, the they have a, you know, they have a shared Taliban problem, yeah. which is a, a, a bad problem to, a bad, bad problem to have. Um, I, I, there are so many vested interests in the status quo continuing, um, as there is in Afghanistan in terms of trying to fix these tribal alliances in, in the mm. South. I mean, you know, the bo you know, as the bombs fall, the m aid money flows. I mean, there was, 
not that I subscribe to the extreme conspiracy <laughs> theory of, of uh, Karzai, that this is all some sort of plot to keep war going on forever, but I think, um, you, know, you know, I think the US has a real role in sort of energizing peace processes, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Kerry has shown himself prepared to tackle some issues. Did um, Kerry get, I mean, it seems to me that Kerry actually did a fairly brilliant job in Afghanistan. He didn't get a lot of public credit for. Right. And, uh, yeah, I think he's been, un I think the Obama administration is, you know, has created an unfortunate narrative for itself whereby it's continuously seen as being defensive and withdrawn. Yeah. I think, in actual fact, their diplomacy has, has been working. They don't nearly do enough to, to how do you talk about how do you treat uh, Obama's December first, two thousand nine West Point speech, which announced the surge and simultaneously announced the withdrawal date? Yeah, well, it's the m the most ridiculous statement. Uh, was it too clever by half, or what? what I mean, what what did it? It was. I mean, it. I mean, it committed the U.S. military to failure. You mm. know, essentially. Um, by saying, you know, surge. I mean, you know, there is a, a model by which we surge and just keep surging and mm. spend 20 years doing it and, you know, and make it our, you know, make it America's sort of project. Um, but, you know, that was never going, never going to happen. Obama knew that. Um, and by creating that hard deadline, um, he undermined undermined the, the surge from the start. You spent a lot of time in two countries where the Americans launched major counterinsurgency wars. Can America, uh, so like what are the big picture takeaways? I mean, in America it does not think of itself as an empire. I mean, the British would have stayed, did stay in Iraq, they did stay in, right. you know, uh, right. the French stayed, but because America sort of believes that it isn't an empire, it shouldn't be, is it always doomed to fail because a successful counterinsurgency by definition is going to take a long time? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> I think there's, you know, essentially, I mean, the, the British example is interesting. I mean, they took 60 years to get to a containment strategy on the northwestern frontier. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure that there's, you know, we can't d do that now. Yeah. You know, in, with there's neither the, there's no political appetite for those sort of, for those sort of wars, I, I'm not sure it sort of spe it speaks to Americans' attitude towards imperialism so much as just the the nature of modern politics now. Right. And, okay. Um, because I mean, the uh, there's the no country is going to be able to really sustain for a lengthy period what's required in a counterinsurgency. I guess the Russians can against the Chechens to some degree, right? Right, but that's their yeah, their, their own territory, their next door neighbor, as yeah. the Brits did against uh, Northern Ireland. I mean, in, in against the IRA. So. so, just final question before throwing it open. So, tell us about your repertorial process. Who you? How did you go about reporting the book, and what was your? Did you have some sort of systemic approach, or how did? Well, my, the approach was to speak to every senior, uh, every commander, U.S. commander mm. of you know, ground forces, every ambassador of the Brits, of the Americans. And, and they all were cooperative? Yeah, I spoke to every um, er, every U.S. commander. They were cooperative to different Level. extents. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them weren't, uh, were less cooperative when they saw the direction of the book and sought to try and stop it. Uh, well, Petraeus being someone who wasn't very pleased with... Uh, but, I mean, the book seems... I haven't read the whole thing. I mean, but, you know, you seem to have a pretty balanced account. It's not... I mean, the, the, ti the subtitle may be a little less, uh, might, does that, why well, we couldn't win the war or the peace in Afghanistan. Um, I mean, what you've said today suggests that, you know, some things went right and some things went wrong. Right. Right? I mean, it's not, it's not fiasco, which, you know, Tom Ricks' book, where, you know, right. the title tells you that right. things were really. <laughs> 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 so how do the people sort of, how do people know where you were going? Well, I mean, you know, as, is, as ever, when reporting a story you mm. don't know where you're going mm. in the beginning it's uh, yeah. you know you just sort of cast your net as widely as possible and um i think what what 
a moment of uh, great clarity was brought to me by, um, by a talk at a frontline club uh, in London when um, they had, which I took part in, it was a 10 year anniversary of the, of, um, of the Iraq invasion mm. and the, the British Labour uh, Shadow uh, Defence Secretary said, you know, the, the real shame about Iraq is that it stopped us from intervening in invading Syria. And mm. um, I hadn't, hadn't particularly thought of uh, political, oh, oh, you know, thoughts through a line of argument. But as soon as I heard that, um, it, uh, I was so enraged by the notion that uh, military intervention in Syria was, you know, was the was the answer. Um, mm. The very next day, I just sort of wrote a, wrote, wrote the introduction to the book um, by tracing through, you know, the alternative to military intervention. The you know this surge narrative has been very strong. I mean, it took place in 2009, but this idea that if only we'd had more troops, more soldiers, mm. more money earlier, everything would have been okay. That was you know a very strong message from 2003 onwards as, as Iraq sort of... During that surge debate in Afghanistan, there was, there was one, it turns out, I think that the smartest, uh, there was uh, various factions. I think one of them was called Go Light But Go Long, I think was one of the... Right. And that, I think that probably would, would have been the smartest Right, right. Which you don't have a big presence, but you do say that you're going to be around for a long time. Right, and uh, and that message is the is the key one because I mean that's always been one of the Taliban as yeah. s strongest messages is we're sticking around. We don't care whether it's ten years or thirty years. You know, we you've got the clocks, but we've got the got the time. Yeah, we sort of. But is that a hard message to say to the American public? I mean, you're getting back to this question because I mean the reason that Obama said this, we're going to withdraw in eighteen months was. You know, I think he was trying to satisfy a domestic constituency. A lot of Americans, like if you ask Americans, do you want to intervene in Syria? The number is like, you know, very, very low. Serious military right. intervention. So, the, I mean, the... It, you but, you, but, I mean, Obama campaigned on, on, right. you know, on more troops. There was a support for, public opinion support for yeah. the Afghan war. His mistake was to sort of throw the floor open to, to debate. And give, allow the military to start talking outrageous number, you know, troop increases that com fundamentally shifted the war. Suddenly, you went from, you know, a, a war of thirty thousand, fairly light, not uh, really that many, not really that right. many casualties, to contemplating a war of one hundred twenty thousand, you know, tripling of the war effort. And yeah. once you once you enter that sort of Iraq level. Of troops, then of course it's not. I guess the counter argument to that is the Taliban really were getting momentum in 2009, right? And they were sort of, and then they were sort of pushed back from Panjwa and other places. But anyway, let's throw it open to questions. If you have a question, just uh, wait for the mic and identify yourself. And Elizabeth, just, you know. thank you. Thank you, Jonathan Roush of Brookings. Could you elaborate on your statement that there's a 30 year civil war in Afghanistan? Is this something that predated? the invasion and continues to this day, or is this something that was set off by U.S. and foreign activity, or what? I'm referring to the, you know, starting with the Soviet invasion, the way in which that sort of in part played on some of the ethnic divides in the country that then became full-blown in the, in the 90s, and in some ways we inherited in 2001 of, and have been exacerbating since, I mean, that small addition. I mean, really, it started in 78, if you think right. about it. It wasn't even because there was already this conflict. Right. So, I mean, you were now three and a half decades into it, really. Right, right. exactly. This was a pacified country in the 90s, wasn't it? Pacified? <laughs> no, I was there during the Civil War. It was like Mogadishu on steroids. I mean, it was in, I mean, Af Afghani the Afghans destroyed Kabul. It was block to block fighting with ethnic and Malicious. It was really. That's why, you know, personally, I have some some hope for the country because I think that kind of experience is in living memory. No one wants to go back to that, and a lot of the people in the government today are people who lived through that. Right. Uh, they don't. They know the. You know, there is a sort of prisoner's dilemma here, which everybody can lose if they don't play nice together. Right. So you can <laughs> way. <of> pretty well. <laughs> but that's. I think. Well, that's why we saw the U national unity government. I mean, look, there's going to be no money without the national unity government. The money spigot just will turn off immediately. Communists lost in 92 because the money stopped. 
Right. right, that was the definitive moment. Right, exactly, and and, the, and that experience of Najibullah, I think, should also, you know, is another reason for hope. I mean, whilst even with the money turned off, he managed to cling on, you know, for a length of time that's uh, a surprising length of time. So you can imagine with enough, you know, with a, a bit of support, he might have, you know, kept the uh, kept the Taliban at, at bay for for longer, and that's sort of the scenario that. Ashraf Ghani finds himself in. Thank you. My name is Nancy Carson. I'm a former congressional staff. Um, I have sort of a question about agency. I work a lot with women's finance things, and we try to get people to do real partnership and understand what people on the ground want. It's hard, and part of what makes it hard is um, there's so many actors. Some bank wants to help you and then they take all the resources. There's NGOs elbowing each other for fame and glory. There's USAID. I, I hear you almost saying, if we could leave them alone for a while, maybe they could kind of improve. But I wonder if you could talk about the diplomats and people you know. We, we, if we are gonna fix this, it's not gonna be the Defense Department or AID and if it's not the White House, I don't know who the we are. Are there actors that you see out there that could come into play to try to f shift this onto a more rational ground? And maybe that, uh, the NSF, maybe you could have explained a bit more about it because yeah. this is a big success story. Right, yeah, I mean, I <coughs> the folks to fix, to begin a, you know, a sustainable nation building program are the Afghan, is the Afghan government. I mean that should has to be the you know the the point of interaction um, and you know there's a fundamental issue about the way in which we go about nation building through USAID and and the State Department that you know bypasses the very government we're trying to build up undermines it you know mm -hmm. etc. I mean that's a you know a major I hope takeaway from you know from the book um, the way in which you know we. Do we, we're not really nation building. We're, we, I mean, we're very successful at creating vast offices and you know a, a bubble in Kabul without you know with much less impact on the ground. Ashraf Ghani um, inherited a program that had been operating during the civil war in the 1990s, which um, in which had been done with the, with the Taliban with a, li a little bit of UN supervision, but largely done by by. Um, by Afghan civil, you know, civil groups that, as as I mentioned, were building schools and and wells, but using the community to identify the projects that they wanted, and then giving them the money to implement them. Ghani took this program and expanded it across across the country in in two thousand and two, um, and it you know it was r remarkably successful, albeit one that was underfunded and, um, and rapidly overwhelmed by the much larger nation building project that the UN and others were engaged in. Um, so, I mean, that's, I mean, that program has survived. It's still there today. There's something to be, to work with. And I'm sure Ghani will, it will be the principal uh, tool because I mean, it became, it's an incredibly effective way of building in these small villages where Westerners can't, can't go. It's hard even for Afghan government officials to go, but you have, you know, you create surers that s select their projects and, you know, you slowly, bit by bit, create civil society. You show that there is a way that people can come together and, and, and do good. And um, that's <laughs> that hasn't happened nearly enough. I, I mean, Ghani, he, for the Tokyo Donors Conference in 2002, he had, he had a request for $250 million to pay Afghan civil servants, many of which were involved in this program, which he didn't, he didn't get. In 2002, he was, he was sacking government officials because we, he couldn't meet payroll. At that same meeting, the UN was given $1.8 billion um, to start its humanitarian assistance programs, um, which was administered through the UN um, and through their own systems. I mean, you know, Ghani has, you know, was, at, one, at one point he tried to block the, 
UN diplomats from coming to the country by refusing them <laughs> visas. That was, the, that was the, the level to which he was trying to, he had sunk to in an attempt to stop um, this, the nation building model. He, he had seen what had happened in, in the 90s, um, as had others like Lakhtar Brahimi, who was the, the UN envoy and spoke, spoke before um, we went in, in um, to the UN, warning of the dangers of allowing in the development consultants and others in, in terms of, you know, imperiling uh, local structures rather than, you know, building them up. The other thing, striking thing about this aid issue is that, I mean, we talk about the billions of dollars that were given, but really we're just paying ourselves because, you know, depending on, you know, Oxfam has a number, I think 40% kind of just goes back to the wherever, you know, to right. the, to the yeah, and the United States is particularly, I think some countries like Sweden are, very cognizant of this, and uh, I mean, but you know, you know, when it's American aid, it might turn out to be eighty percent of the total is really just paying ourselves. So it's this right. aid is not, it's at you know, it's it's worse than not getting to the Afghans. It's actually you know just cycling back right. into our own pockets. Right. Um, and so, this is, I, yeah, I mean, the amount of money that we have spent on the place, it, it should be, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a hydroelectric dam that I write about quite a bit in the book because it both because it was one of the biggest nation building projects and also one of the, the greatest white elephants. This was, <laughs> a, this was a dam that um, had been built by the US in the, in the early 60s and um, it had had two turbines built um, and one, w one was missing and the two that were installed were somewhat, uh, you know, were struggling. Um, so early on Ashraf Ghani sent a uh, did a study to work out how much it would cost to fix the, the turbines. Um, to fix the turbines, he, he came back with a $100,000 cost. And to install the third turbine, it turned out the Taliban had actually contracted it with a Chinese company for, fo for $4 million. And it was actually some of the parts of which were already in Pakistan waiting to be driven, driven in. Um, we ignored all of, all of that. Um, First of all, because we didn't do nation building for that very brief window of time. And then mm -hmm. because USAID was going to do it on their own terms. Um, and those terms now have cost almost $2 billion. Um, the one of the turbines is fixed. The other is still shaky. And the third one is still missing. And actually, just reading a couple of days ago there, in their sort of post, their 2015 budget, they're still looking for another $300 million to, uh, to keep up alive the the dream of getting Kajaki Dam to work and it's you know Kajaki Dam was a particularly poignant reconstruction project because it was partly the need to uh, clear the Taliban from around the area that f that brought the British there in 2005 and 2006 and mm. forced the British at the behest of the Americans into these small communities in northern uh, Helmand that led to that led ultimately to the surge because the Brits found they couldn't handle it and um, needed the Americans to bail themselves out, all in the name of this great white elephant project that could have been fixed for $100,000 in 2002. Gentleman here. Uh, Gregory Andrews with the Heritage Foundation. Um, you seemed quite a bit more optimistic about Afghanistan rather than Iraq. And um, I guess my question is, wh what is the current state of the Afghani army and uh, how will that play a future in um, stabilizing Afghanistan? In a recent press conference, uh, General Austin seemed pretty optimistic about the Iraqi army and that if the Iraqi government could be more inclusive of Sunnis, the, uh, the army, at least in Iraq, already has a structure to it and uh, could be worked with to provide a more stable Iraq. But I guess on the flip side, what, what's the situation like in Afghanistan? Uh, well, I think that's a, a lesson why you should take Gen the generals with a pinch of salt, because I'm not sure the Iraqi military is one that should inspire 100% confidence <laughs> at this moment, having just surrendered half the country. Well, it seems to have only one gear, which is reverse. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> yes, well, at least it's, you know what they're going to do. But <laughs> that's, that's, that's something. Um, you know, the, uh, the, y the you know you're, wh what you're trying to do is match up forces. So <coughs> the Afghan military has improved a great deal it's capable of holding cities and towns, but what it, you know, the military doesn't operate in some sort of virtual battlefield. They are 
operating in communities. And when those communities are not supportive of the Afghan government, it's very hard for the military to go against it. The reason why the Taliban won't seize and never were in real danger of seizing places like Kandahar is that there are you know, huge vested interests in keeping Kandahar, as there is in Kabul, open. There's the Taliban themselves have got family there, they've got money there, that's where the opium transactions take place. Um, you know, <coughs> when you put the Afghan military in that context, it can work, it can work well. They, get, they know the context, they know these power plays, and it's, you know, the Afghan, the Taliban aren't going to sort of come charging at the horizon and, and seizing the city. I think there are real questions about how they can, how effective they can be out in the out in the provinces, and um, <coughs> and you know we're seeing that in the fact that places like Sangin and Musakali, these small towns, um, have already sort of largely largely fallen. Um, so you know I wouldn't, uh, you know, I, you can't have a hundred percent faith in the Afghan military, just like you can't in the Iraqi. I think you can have a hundred percent faith in. Uh, when, you, when you align that military with local interests, that it will stand the test of, of you know, the Taliban or any force trying to change the status quo. That, I mean, that's, uh, you know, the main message of the book in some ways is that you've got to go with the Afghan grain. Um, hmm. You can seek to change it over time, but it's, a, you know, it's a generational conflict uh, and one that will, you know, it's going to take 30 years or more to... Um, you know, to to resolve. What does that resolution look like? Oh, in the in the distant future. Um, you know, I think you know that there are some gains, civil society gains, which mm. even you know, uh, even if in some scenario the Taliban were to seize the country again, I think will be hard to put back in the bottle. Um, many of those gains the US had nothing to do with other than getting rid of the Taliban and those are in you know in terms of educational policies I've always found it very interesting the Taliban themselves have at least publicly claimed that their own that they now support girls in in, in schools um, you know that's a you know a, an important shift one of one which we're not going to see the benefits of for you know, for decades, but it, it has happened. Just like mobile phones have transformed how Afghans communicate and how they how they get paid as well. How they get exactly. I mean, you know, as in Africa, there's a huge number of ways in which you can sort of bypass certain development hurdles. Um, you know, that's a, another conceptual shift that's going to be hard. You know, you can't change that back again. Um, or at least I would be very surprised if that were to were to happen, and th those are changes we're going to take. It's going to take time to play out, and I think with, with sensitive, limited development, building on schools where they're where they're wanted, building on the country's healthcare, you can, you know, you can, you know, you can continue continue the you know some of the positive trends, but um, that's uh, it, I mean it is a distant <laughs> it is a distant. Uh, image of a, you know, of a... Semi-functional semi -functional <laughs> Central Asian country, right? That's right. what, that's probably the end goal. Right. That is good. Christina. Hi, I'm uh, Christina Asquith, the journalist in Af Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, Peter, this is my question is for you. Jack and I have talked a lot about how our takeaway from a decade of covering these wars is that you have to let the locals make the calls. You have to let the locals create the solutions. You have to follow mm. their lead. It has to be driven by grassroots organizations. Mm. And, you know, I, I want to ask you just if you could drill down on that, elaborate on that idea a little bit more. Do you agree with that? Why do you think that doesn't happen more? Is it, is it feasible for it to happen? Well, I think, you know, as Jack, it's, it's a national solidarity program, which, um, you know, Claire Lockhart, who's a friend of New America, and, and Ashraf Ghani, I mean, was kind of their brainchild and I mean that's it's it's a rare example of something that really worked because it did you know as Jack outlined you know the Shura had to come together they had to make a political decision about what they were going to do there wasn't a huge amount of money involved it was you know 50,000 bucks for whatever and so that worked I mean I think we 
I mean, I think the, uh, the general principle is true. I, I mean, the one sort of caveat would be, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to, the West, quote unquote, is going to bring better technocratic solutions to some things, you know. Well, you know, let's look at the, you, Jack mentioned the mobile phone. Well, well, how did that start? Because this is one of the big successes. It was, uh, it was the Aga Khan who came in and set up the Roshan telephone network, which, I mean, Afghanistan, it didn't have a phone system under the Taliban. I mean, it didn't have a phone system. <laughs> you know? right. Now there was like, I don't know, 60% penetration. I mean, every Afghan has a cell phone. So, so there are some things that are naturally going to have to come from outside. The Aga Khan isn't the West, uh, but he's sort of westernized, let's say. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I, I, I basically agree with the premise, except in situations where, you know, if 9-11 hadn't happened, the Taliban would still be in power in Afghanistan, probably. So, you know, one thing that we did do is we overthrew the Taliban. That's something the Afghans couldn't do for themselves. And I think there were some pretty good outcomes from that, and there were, you know, some less good outcomes from that. And we saw in Libya that we can do these kinds of interventions, and then the outcome is completely catastrophic, right? I mean, we overthrew Gaddafi, and it's like Libya is, I'm, I'm not an expert in it, but it seems to be in very deep trouble. Mm. So there are some things we're going to have to, I mean, I guess the lesson of all this is that it's very easy to overthrow people. The question is, what, do you, what comes next? And, you know, in Iraq, there was, you know, Tommy Franks retired, what, three weeks after the invasion or something. He, you know, there was no plan. In Afghanistan, there was no plan either. <sighs> but it sort of maybe when, I don't know why, why did, why did it get, that's a really interesting question back to you, Jack, which is, why did it go better in Afghanistan than in, in Iraq? I mean, you, we know all the things that we kind of screwed up in Iraq. Uh, I mean, Afghanistan is doing better. Right. What? I was it just because it was a much simpler society and anything's better than what preceded it or what? Yeah, I mean, in, uh, my take is that, you know, in Iraq you had this huge bureaucracy in which every, pretty much everyone was plugged into in one yeah. shape or form, this huge state-run autocracy. And what we sought to do early on was dismantle it. Yeah. Um, and also persecute half of it's half yeah. of its members. I mean, that, there aren't those expectations, weren't those expectations in, in Afghanistan. There weren't the same structures that to be torn down. Yeah. Now, our mis I think our mistake was that we didn't allow the existing structures that were there to, we didn't help rebuild them or you know, align them enough with the government. We took the opposite approach. Have we learned from our mistakes? I mean, just collective mistakes? I mean, because one of the things is, uh, you know, a group like Al-Qaeda doesn't seem to learn much from its mistakes, or ISIS may have learned something. Right. But to what extent did you see, in, I mean, you're covering 13 years in the book, did you see people, you know, did the United States over time sort of unscrew things that had screwed up? N no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, th I, I, mean, I think we may be, we could be approaching, you know, a point now as, as you know, that Israeli politician was claimed to have said, you know, America always does the right thing in the end after exhausting mm. other, every other opportunity. I think it's Churchill, famously. Well, you know, I, I actually <laughs> looked into it at okay. one point, so there's some, some debate over okay. who said Attributed it. to Churchill. I, li I like the idea that it's Churchill. Yeah. Yes, but, um, so, you know, I think we've tried lots, we've tried the whole gamut of strategies in yeah. Afghanistan, and they haven't really worked. The last one we haven't tried is our not really, you know, not being there so much, and I think that, you know, that may... You know, if, if we can get back to 2002, 2003 again, mm. um, that would be, that would be s successful. But that's only, the, that's only the, f the first step. It was like the surge in Iraq reset the clock back to 2003, 2004. Yeah. And then we, you know, then for a variety of reasons, we squandered that, that, that window. And, you know, we have that, we have a probably a, a broader window in if in Afghanistan than there was. Uh, was I think I think you're right. These big secular trends, the education, the cell phone penetration, the expectations of right. young people, those are going to be very hard to put back in the. And so, even though we made all these mistakes, we kind of did a sort of set the stage for this thing to sort of some of these good things to happen to some degree, right? Right. Do you, let, let me ask you, Peter. I mean, do you see can Pakistan have a positive role? I, I would say. Uh, it's in Pakistan's interest completely to have a positive role. 
and you know, Ghani went to Pakistan very quickly, right. and uh, General Sharif was just in Afghanistan. So, you know, there was Karzai was constantly. Uh, uh, he was saying a lot of very negative things about the Pakistanis. As you know, it's very strongly held belief in Afghanistan that everything that goes wrong can be is attributed right. to Pakistan. Um, so I think, you know, uh, and, you know, Kiani and General Sharif both firmly believe that the biggest problem they face is the Taliban. Mm -hmm. It's not India, right? Yeah. And that's true. It took a long while to, like, wake up to that. So, as you said, I think that they, they, it's in their interest to you know, to kind of make sure that this, you know, the civil war doesn't start again, the Taliban, you know, isn't marching on Kabul. They have shared interests. You know, the head of the Pakistani Taliban, as you know, lives in Afghanistan now, which is sort of an interesting role reversal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but that's, you know, that's a shared interest in like getting, a, trying to manage this. Right. Well, thank you, Jack, for a brilliant presentation. Thank you, President.